Hi, welcome to Elfco. I'm Dave. I'm the manager here. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about sort of what Elfco is, um, where our place in the community, and why the co-op is different and important to East Lansing. East Lansing Food Co-op is a community-owned store, so anybody who would like to buy a share can. Currently we have about 3,200 of our closest friends and neighbors who own a share of the co-op. So. Co-op's been around since 1976. Started out as a little buying club out of somebody's garage. Had our first storefront down on campus and moved to our current location in about 1980, in the early 80s. So, and we've been here ever since. Being an owner at Elfco means that you get to en enjoy a lot of the benefits of ownership like you would in any other business um, but it's not whereas most if you buy a share in most other businesses the primary goal is to you know hopefully make some money on your investment here um, the investments pretty minimal and the goal is really to um, not to get a, a return monetarily on your investment but more socially that what it does is everybody combines a little bit of money in to help fund the, the you know, stocking of the store and having the goods available for anybody in the community who wants to come and take part. So, we also do a lot of things. We have member benefits throughout the month. We have like on the 10th of every month, we give an extra 10% off virtually everything in the store um, to owners as a little thank you for their trust and you know, investment in us. And um, we do member only sales throughout the month. And we also try when we can to do little special special events here and there. Um, we have an annual owners meeting every April, so we're actually in the planning stages for that for this year and try to let folks know how the business went the prior year and sort of what sort of plans we have coming up for the you know in the coming year or hopefully a couple of years. The owners get together once a year at, this, at the annual meeting and we have an election for board of directors and the board um, just like other corporations have board of directors, our board of directors is, you know, basically charged with the oversight of the uh, of the store, and sort of they just keep an eye on how things are going. They, um, you know, they help plan for the future growth of the co-op, um, whilst keeping an eye on how stable things are currently. And um, anybody can both run for the board. Any owner can run for the board of directors if they'd like and anybody can contact our board of directors. It's very open communication. One email address that goes to all the directors makes it pretty easy. Um, we have a bulletin board where people can leave comments for the board of directors. And so I try to, try to have a very open dialogue. So yeah, you know, and some people have the misconception that you know, for 60 bucks they get to come in and, you know, and since they're an owner, they get to say, oh, we do, we, um, I want you to do this or that. Or, doesn't quite work like that. Um, the board of directors hires a general manager, which is in this case me currently, um, and then I hire the staff and, and we take care of the operations side. The board is oversight and, and the staff and I run the operations, day-to-day -day operations of the store. So we decide what we're gonna carry, um, you know, where we're gonna put it, what we're gonna price it at. Um, and you know, it's, I think it's important for folks to know too, though, that we, you know, we're very open to hearing the suggestions of our shoppers, both owners and non-owners, because we realize that that's the way we're going to best serve the community is by carrying the things that they actually want to shop for and buy. So, um, so we have things where at the register, um, shoppers can tell us if there's something that they want that we don't have. Uh, we keep a little log, and if something shows up a few times, and the the buyers will generally bring it in, see if it. You know, is popular enough to keep and so people can have fairly direct input maybe not uh, an absolute say uh, in the day-to-day -day operations but we try to listen so it's part of the customer service and value that we have you know when, 
when one starts to talk about the importance of local foods, I think more and more people are talking about that. I think one of the things that's really nice to know is that co-ops in general have been doing that for a long time, and Elfco specifically. We have growers that we've, we've had relationships for 15, 20 years. You know, we've been buying their products, helping them plan what they're going to grow, um, you know, based on what our, our customers want us to carry. And, and helping sort of try to take some of the uncertainty out of, the, of, our, of our growers, you know, planning and, and uh, as much as we can, um, and you know, supporting them with, actually we, we just made our first loan to one of our growers to help them with their operations, expand their operations a little bit, so that's exciting. Um, we, you know, it's something that we feel pretty passionate about is trying to help build capacity both with our current growers and hopefully with new growers as they come on and, and as more people are looking for a more meaningful relationship with their food you know that's it's one of the things we've been doing you know really since we started so um, it's nice to see that folks are coming back to that I think there's a lot of um, a lot of credit has to go to sort of being in an academic community where folks are not just sort of philosophically thinking about it, but also looking at the real, on the ground sort of ramifications of how you build a sustainable local food um, movement and system. And I think that a co-op should be a vital part of that. I think that control on the retail side um, is, I mean, it's a, it's a key part of that equation, that the community ownership of a store, of a grocery store, like Elfco is um, just absolutely necessary, I think. So, um, and, and we're looking at, when we look at this, not only from the retail side of things, not just what can Elfco sell more of, but la last year um, in 2010, we were lucky enough to be able to help create a community garden in an empty lot that was next door to the store. Um, you know, for three or four years, I sat and watched this lot being, you know, all summer long, lawnmower would come up, mow it every day or one, once a week and, uh, and I just thought, oh, that's a waste of waste of gas and a waste of some empty land and last year it, it ended up being this great thing. I think we had um, 34 growers, I think 20 plus garden plots where, you know, uh, folks from um, the neighborhood and, and really from around town, we had some folks who came quite a distance who were Elfco owners uh, garden there. We, we grew food for um, that, we, that was then sold at a local church with the funds going to the local food bank. So we tried to even connect the gardeners with doing some some good work around uh, access to good healthy food. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's one of the things I look forward to in the future, sort of us being more involved. Um, certainly the more financially stable the co-op is, the more then we can look outward and look for opportunities to partner with other groups going forward. So, and we're getting there. We've, we've had, you know, we had a few tough years in the past and they're not too distant past, but, but we've turned that around, I think, and are looking pretty good right now. One of the farms that we really, you know, I, that I really like that we work with um, you know, not to single anybody out as, you know, but, but there, there are a lot of farms we like to work with. But one in particular um, that I like is the uh, Giving Tree Farm in North Lansing. Um, Giving Tree works with folks who have cognitive uh, challenges due to closed head in brain injuries and things like that, um, teaching them skills about gardening and even they run a market stand at a local farmer's market. Um, they have hoop houses up and they grow a variety of, of produce throughout the year um, and we carry, you know, like greens from them. Um, not in the dead of winter usually, but uh, pretty close. I mean, it's the season extension stuff that they do allows us to carry spinach or microgreens from them a good portion of the year. And so it's nice to, to be able to support the work that they're doing plus, you know, keep it local, uh, you know, for our shoppers. Uh, for a good, like I said, a good portion of the year. So there's there's that. Um, you know, really like the fact that we've got a, you know a good grower up in Owasso, um, Owasso Organics. Um, Pooh and Richard are the are the farmers there, and they they do uh, you know a variety of things, but they do like things like tomatoes really well. So our our tomato stock all summer long is pretty much 
the Wasa Organics. Um, one of the things we've done with them in recent years is, is they've gotten, um, you know, they, as their capacity is going, and then as people are getting more interested in, in home food preservation like canning, we've worked out a deal where we'll sell flats of tomatoes. When, so when they have extra, you know, when their harvest of tomatoes is coming in really heavy and they have to move the, you know, that stuff while it's fresh, we team up with them and offer special pricing on flats of tomatoes for people who aren't growing their own so that they can get tomatoes at a good price, get them canned, keep them for later. So, you know, it works out for everybody. Consumer gets them at a, at a discount. The grower isn't sitting on a bunch of stock that they're fretting about whether or not it's going to sell. You know, and we're helping be the conduit between those two because that, you know, we're here seven days a week. And you can try to get to the farmer's market. You can try to pre-order everything, and that's great. And we love it when folks, you know, get, we, we support farmer's markets. Um, but there, you know, there, there are some inherent issues that we, we can help fill in some of the gaps because the farmers have to, can't always be at market. They got to be working their fields. They've got to be, you know, planting, harvesting, weeding, and all of that. Um, so we like to be able to fill in throughout even the growing season with when they're not available. So, but yeah, those are a couple of the farms. We've got a wildflower farm up in Bath is another good farm that we like to use. They do, they do a wide variety of things and every year they have something because of the way they rotate their crops. They have different things that they try to sort of specialize in in various years. So, you know, one year it may be kale. They're, they're doing a ton with kale. Um, other years, it's been you know broccoli. We have you know local broccoli, which is often a pretty tough thing to do. They brought us beautiful broccoli for a full summer. Um, heirloom tomatoes, they do as well. Um, so we bring in some of those, and they like to do a lot of variety. So it, it, they actually bring us really fun stuff that you know people get pretty excited about and don't see every day, and certainly don't see on the shelves at sort of the big chain groceries. Sure. So one of the nice things about living in Michigan is the fact that we've got a ton of co-ops around. There's, um, starting up north, there's the Marquette Co-op in Marquette. There is Grain Train Co-op in Petoskey. There's um, Oriana, which is in Traverse City. There is um, Green Tree, which is in Mount Pleasant. Um, there's also, so then there's People's Co-op Kalamazoo. There's the East Lansing Food Co-op. Um, there's the People's Ann Arbor Food Co-op. And there's also the Ypsilanti Food Co-op. So Michigan actually has, I think, the third highest number of co-ops in the state behind Minnesota and California. And we're right in there with California. So I, <laughs> if anybody wants to start a co-op around, <laughs> we'll help. Um, but anyway. Um, so it's nice because we're, well, some states have one or two co-ops, say Texas, where Wheatsville Co-op in Austin is kind of the food co-op, um, other than buying clubs and things like that. Um, they may well be the only food co-op in all of Texas. So, um, you know, it's nice to have the variety of co-ops that we have. And it helps because we get to work together. Um, and that's happened informally throughout the years, but then, um, a few years ago, I guess I would say eh, about 10 or 12 years ago, co-ops regionally started to form little cooperative grocery associations. Um, Elfco and the other Michigan co-ops were in a Great Lakes uh, version of that with some co-ops in northern Indiana and, and Ohio. Um, and then about 10 years ago, the, the, all those regional ones came together to form the National Cooperative Groceries Association. And the NCGA co-ops as a whole, there's about 120 of us all together at this point. Um, we're the second largest, as a group, the second largest buyer of natural foods um, behind you know, one other major natural food store. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're really kind of a, you know, have become this sort of, well, while each of us maintains local control over our individual co-ops, um, we banded together to be this virtual chain where that helps, you know, on sort of cost savings side of things, we all, you know, we share a common, say, printed grocery bag that we use in our stores. And so we don't each have to go out and 
design or buy or get generic ones. It's nice because it helps get out the co-op message with things like that. Uh, we share informational pamphlets that are, you know, so we, we each have access to those if we choose to put those in our store and we don't each have to do our own version of them. Um, we, we have sale flyers that are, you know, we put out every two weeks at this point. Um, and that's, those are deals that are, are developed through the NCGA and through their buying department. And then, then each of our individual co-ops can participate in so that we help get cost savings by, by you know, purchasing sort of in big volumes um, that we can then, you know, give, pass on to the customers. So it's got, the, the association has a lot of benefits for us and for pretty much every other co-op in it. It's one of the nice things about it is there's no, we, we as a group don't make decisions that don't benefit everybody. Um, they, look, they look at, you know, how everything's going to affect every co-op. And, uh, you know, we don't go forward if everybody's not, until we find out, figure out how we're going to make something work for everybody. So it's a good group. I think Elfco has certainly benefited quite a bit from its association with that. One example of how this association works well is that a few years ago, Elfco was struggling. You know, it was really, we actually got within about two months of being sort of out of operating capital to run the store at the rate at which we were losing money at the time. Um, and, and when the other co-ops, you know, as they saw that this was happening, they offered to come and help. And when we finally had it together enough to accept that help, what they did was they sent GMs from around the country with people who had specialized um, expertise in areas where Elfco is struggling to come in for a weekend and to look at our operations to you know talk with staff members to talk with you know various folks on the board and to figure out what what were the things that they could help us with what resources they could connect us with and they they basically gave us a roadmap out out of the problems that we were in um, you know, we got you know, a nice report that says, here's the things that we would do. Highest priority, do these things, absolutely. Um, you know, we recommend that you do these things, absolutely. You know, again, none of this was mandatory on us. But, um, you know, here's some things you might want to consider doing, if you, you know, when you get a little breathing room. And then here's stuff, you know, think about long term. So it was nice because it both helped us have, we, we, we had this sort of, you know, ball a string of troubles with you know and we didn't know which ones to pull on and deal with first and what what loose ends to tie up first and how to do it even if we did know so this association came in and supported us and helped us along you now we had to show that we were you know gonna do you know gonna work on these things um, but the more we worked the more we we worked on correcting those things the more support we we sort of got you know as they saw that this was this was a store that was going to turn around and it was willing to, to take the help and implement it, the, then the more help we got. And, and now we're at the point, you know, within about two years, we actually had pretty clearly turned the corner and had gotten back on, you know, the, going in the right direction. Sales were increasing. We were, we were making a little bit of money at the end of the year. We were doing fine. So then we, we turned around and a co-op that was struggling in the region, um, I was able to go and help them with some of the things that I had learned. And so we sort of, that was our sort of karmic payback for the help that we had gotten was to find somebody else who was struggling. And, you know, and now that co-op is actually, I would say, just about out of the woods. So, you know, in, in the space of five years, um, I think that it's very safe to say that association has saved at least two co-ops in the Midwest. We don't do any plastic bags here. Um, again, it's local control at different co-ops, so some co-ops might. Um, if our owners say that they really, really want us to have plastic bags, it's something we would have to seriously consider. Um, what we try to do when there's something like that, though, say there was a movement on to make pl get plastic bags because they're easier to deal with, is we would try to educate our owners about why, you know, what, what are the consequences of their choice between paper and plastic, um, and hopefully show them that you know, you think paper, especially reused paper, or even better, bringing your own cloth bags is a is a much better alternative, and we'll try to we'll even try to do things like we'll we'll 
you know, sell cloth bags at costs, say, to try to encourage that. Or we'll point out, here's how long your cloth bag will last, and you get five cents every time you bring it, so it's going to pay for itself down the road. If you buy it today and you keep bringing it, you're, you know, and if you're careful with it, you'll make money on it, you know? <laughs> Um, so we try to we try not to limit ourselves to those sort of choices um, that we you know that we're often sort of just given and told to accept that here's your options. We try to look for even better options if they go off. So. And this one of the things that I think our staff is particularly good at is also taking information from shoppers. Our shoppers are, are well read, well, well informed. Um, you know, and they come in and they say, hey, I, I heard about this. What do you know about it? Do you think, you know, what do you think about it? Um, and we're very willing, again, it goes back partially to, I mean, it's in our self-interest to listen and respond because that tells us what our shoppers want and our owners. But, but also because we're trying to do this the right way, and there are places where we can we can improve, and we know that. So, we're actually what well, we are is a not not a nonprofit, but a not for profit. In that, our goal isn't to return, um, you know, a return on investment, a monetary return on investment to our owners, but our goal is to return goods and services and access. So we're in this odd gray middle ground, um, but you're exactly right. I mean, but we're, we exist in this capitalist system and it's, it's sometimes tough to explain to folks, especially folks who come in thinking that this is, this is Nirvana. You know, they, they found the co-op, they're excited about it. They think this is an agent for social change and, and, and we're gonna, you know, I'm going to join, and I, my voice is going to be heard. I mean, you know, we have folks who do come in thinking that for 60 bucks, I get to tell people how to run the store. And we're not that, and we can't yet be that, not in this system. And, um, you know, I, I sort of I kind of liken it to the idea that, um, you know, you've paid your $60, but so have, you know, 3,199 other people and what you prefer may not be what they all prefer. And what we as staff do is in everybody's interest, try to balance everybody's desires out. And that, you know, the more people who are involved and in the, in sort of the, the larger group of people that we're able to serve, then the more options we can provide right, within the capitalist system because we've got the sales volume and things to expand and give people more. So tell all your friends to come and join too. They may not, again, for $60, they can't tell us exactly what to carry, but you can, we can build our voice together and we can build, that, again, that community of folks who get their, you know, their needs, definitely, and some, again, some desires. It's not all you know, tofu and granola. Um, <laughs> It's not about seeing how little you can give everybody to get to the cash to the bottom line, um, but it's actually how much can you give to everybody and still have a bottom line. That's what we're trying to figure out, is how do you take care of everybody along the way in a fair and decent manner. Um, you know, Utah Phillips is the one who said, you know, folks singing, uh, you know, I'm making a living, not a killing. And I think that's the perfect sort of ideal for co-ops is that we're all just we're trying to have everybody make a living and nobody makes a killing so co-ops you know look at this idea that we have to not only be financially viable so we we do need to you know there's this idea that you always want to get to zero at the end of the year and you know and that's great until the first time a cooler breaks down you have to pay the repair guy and you've got zero in the bank you know? So most of us have figured out that that's that a zero net income is not really the game, but and and that's probably the last thing co-ops figured out. I think the the social aspect of what we were doing and the environmental impact and having a you know certainly a lessened negative environmental impact and quite honestly I think a lot of us have moved towards having a positive environmental impact. 
um, and having a social impact where we work with other groups in the community, where you know by the, our treatment of our producers and our staff, our, that we that we we serve you know a, a community and social good bottom line as well as a financial and an environmental. So by keeping those three things in balance, um, it does make you know having you know shooting at three targets as it were is a little more difficult than just having one. Um, but nobody said it was going to be easy, you know, right? So we, uh, I think it's a valuable thing to do. And it's, to me, it's, it's a much better way of doing it um, than just money. So. Um.